Who is Saint Germain and why is he important to the events happening today? Saint Germain is considered to be an ascended master by many occult groups. Before his ascension, he incarnated many times or lived many lives throughout history. These incarnations have been documented by his followers in Theosophy, the New Age, Freemasonry, the Order of the Golden Dawn, the Rosicrucians, and the Knights of Columbus for centuries. He is considered to be the true sovereign Grand Master of both Freemasonry and the Knights of Columbus. Some of Saint Germain's alleged incarnations include the High Priest of Atlantis, Thoth, Hermes Trismegistus, King Solomon, Plato, Merlin the Magician, Christopher Columbus, and Francis Bacon, to name a few. The something that, by their own admission, Theosophy and Freemasonry are making a concerted effort to bring the world under the control of the Ascended Masters. And they are, by their own admission, disseminating Ascended Master doctrine throughout the church. And after we talk about uh, some of these things, you're going to spot it. And in... Uh, the future, you're going to be able to be discerning and recognize these Ascended Master doctrines. The idea of random incarnations or reincarnations cannot explain why he was so many influential characters. A better explanation for his many lives is that he is a powerful entity, most likely Godrael. <laughs> the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. One story the guys told me, the story I believe. Make to order whatever you would desire in the way of uh, really neat leather stuff. So, with that taken care of, let's get into our broadcast. And John has a slide presentation prepared tonight. And this is an exciting topic. And it's such a pertinent topic. It is really recognizing the deliberate plan of the enemy to bring the world under the control of fallen angels and they're uh, it's a full-blown assault so john take us on the midnight ride wizards of old and the great white brotherhood all right and uh one thing i do want to mention is stay tuned because at the end of the show we will be um announcing the winners of the contest that we had uh, we did a show a couple weeks ago and the prizes are pretty awesome there's first second and third place and so we'll be announcing that later on, and uh, just stay tuned. 
Um, so basically, I want to preface this, that what we're going to be talking about tonight, because I want people to understand why we're talking about it. Because, um, you know, David talked a little bit about it, but this is something that is very, very, very prevalent in Christianity, uh, in every sect of Christianity, I guess let's put it that way, every denomination. Um, what we're talking about here is so subtle and so smooth and so crafty that is very hard to tell the difference between somebody that believes in this and somebody that believes in Christianity or any form of Christianity because they do believe in a, in Jesus. They do believe in that, but they have a different version of the gospel and a different idea behind it. And this is important to learn because I, as I did a lot of this research, I actually went online on my Facebook and I hashtagged different things and I looked and I could see that a lot of my friends are actually involved in this and a lot of people that I know are actually involved in this stuff uh, very subtly and so anyways we're going to start this out so this show is, talks about the Wizards of Old and the Great White Brotherhood so the Great White Brotherhood uh, is it's a belief system akin to theosophy and it's actually theosophists are one of the ones that helped develop it and, and to the new age teachings as well and they all share a similar route uh, there's a westernized version of this whole thing as well, and they all kind of vary a little bit, not much, but the adepts and the mysteries and theosophists uh, will understand the references that we're going to make, and uh, the differences are, they're so subtle that basically they're not almost non-existent. So, I mean, it doesn't really matter these subtle differences. The whole idea and the scheme of everything is exactly the same, and we'll talk about a little of the differences later on as we go through this. So, um the members of this um, this brotherhood, this this so-called brotherhood, and this um, great white brotherhood are they're called the masters of ancient wisdom, and they're also known as the ascended masters. And if you guys remember, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago we did the seven root race teachings, which also come from this idea, and uh, the masters of ancient wisdom. And uh, we'll get into a little bit more about the ascended masters and their teachings but i want to discuss their history first because i think it's important to know where this teaching comes from and uh where it kind of go you know goes from here so we have um let me see here there we go we got the next slide up there it looks like no no not, not having it here so for some reason it's not showing my next slides on here so let me let me uh change something up here let me see if i can get the get this to do what's right but in the in the meantime david if you want to talk a little bit about that so let me see if i can get this kink worked out in our thing i have for some reason usually when i switch it it shows you guys but it's not showing you so um go ahead david well one of the tremendous and terribly sad things is that people are being duped into believing as the apostle paul said another christ and another spirit and I'm going to read one paragraph here from a book entitled Masonry in the New Age. And it's written by a man by the name of Lynn Perkins. He's a Freemason and an Ascended Master teaching. As there are many, many, and most of your really adept teachings on the Ascended Masters have come from Freemasonry and Theosophy almost exclusively. And it really originated in Theosophy. The term was coined toward the latter part of the 19th century in the late 1800s. But of course, this has been around. These are just fallen angels. They've been around for a long time. But this term, Ascended Masters, and the plan to bring the world under their domination, it came uh, it became codified into a plan in the late 1800s. And in Theosophy, we saw Madame Blavatsky, and after her, Annie Besant and C.W. Leadbeater, and following them, Allison Foster Bailey, and Manley P. Hall, Freemasonry's greatest philosopher. These are the main... <music>
this ascended master doctrine. And it was originated in theosophy, and they saw within the structure of Freemasonry the framework they needed to disseminate this throughout the earth. And we'll be bringing forth specific quotes throughout the, the evening on their deliberate plan to do just that. And on page 207 of this book, Masonry in the New Age, here's where so many people are, are being led astray and being led to damnation. It says, in times past and in our time, when the great ascended masters like Jesus of Nazareth wished to communicate with earth beings, they almost always selected a person who had been taught and had acquired the spiritual power to receive and record their messages. In a vast literature on the subject, these precipitants uh, participants of such thoughts and messages of a master are called sensitive and he uses what's called overshadowing or channeling to take control and guide humans at various points of their lives to influence the events of history since lucifer is not a name but a title the angel associated with being the light bearer or the giver of knowledge for enlightenment is called godrail that information along with the names of the other fallen angels as well as countless other important historical events has been withheld from us by the dark occultists throughout history who wanted us to remain ignorant. Knowing that Lucifer's name is Godrael will become important, as I discuss the history of Saint Germain and his many incarnations. Saint Germain's followers claim that he was Hermes, an Egyptian sage who was synonymous with the god Thoth. Hermes is credited with creating alchemy and developing a system of metaphysical beliefs that are known today as Hermeticism, which is the basis of most modern right-hand path magic. Before he was considered a god, he was the greatest Egyptian philosopher and the founder of ancient Egyptian mystery schools. He received his wisdom while in a meditative trance and wrote over 40 books, including the Emerald Tablets. It is in the Emerald Tablets that Thoth, or Hermes, connects himself to Atlantis, claiming that he was the high priest there. To the Egyptians, Hermes' knowledge was so great that they saw him as a communicator with the gods, and eventually inducting him into the Egyptian pantheon of gods. Another book he allegedly wrote, The Book of Thoth, was written in Egyptian hieroglyphs and described the key to immortality through a process of awakening certain areas of the brain similar to the practices of Buddhist monks. Alchemy, taught by Thoth, is an ancient path of spiritual purification and transformation, the expansion of consciousness, and the development of insight and intuition through images and symbols. During medieval and renaissance times, alchemy spread through the western world and was further developed by Kabbalists, Rosicrucians, and astrologers, and other occultists. It functioned on two levels, mundane and spiritual. On a mundane level, alchemists sought to find a process to convert base metals such as lead into gold. On a spiritual level, alchemists worked to purify themselves by eliminating the base material of the self and achieving gold of enlightenment. Hermeticism teaches that energetic evolution, or transmuting the body into a light body, is the true meaning and purpose of life. In my opinion, this is like saying that you save yourself through your own works. Now I'm going to try to show you that the New Age movement fulfills a need in a world that has rejected Jesus, but seeks to fill the spiritual void left behind. And before you turn this off, let me just say that if you were a victim of religious abuse through the church or your family, then I'm sorry. These organizations and beliefs are usually contradictory with the actual living word of God. If you reject God based on the actions of men, that's like saying that you'll never eat vegetables again because you hate vegans. Instead of being angry at God, become angry at the people who twisted and abused the truth for their own need for control, or used it as a form of punishment. I'm going to be addressing this exact issue in a future video. If you are in the new age or in the occult, please continue watching this video because I made it to try and give you a different perspective and a different way to think about this whole thing. So back to Hermeticism. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is a system of magic practiced by adepts and interestingly, it is also an organization within the Illuminati. Through traditional initiation and spiritual practices of Hermetic Astrology, magic, 
and alchemy promises to give you the concrete tools to achieve the solar ascension. Many people today believe that there will be a solar flash and the ones who have chosen to ascend will become light bodies at that time. If you watch my other videos, The Prophetic Protocols of Q, you'll know that Q is following the protocols of the illuminated sons of the Golden Dawn, which correlate to Saint Germain's plan for humanity. Most secret societies' beliefs and rituals can be traced back to the Egyptian mystery schools or to Babylon. The most, the most powerful of these mystery schools was known as the Royal School of the Master Craftsmen at Karnak, or as the Great White Brotherhood. It's called the White Brotherhood because of the white robes that they wore and also the type of magic they practiced, as well as the white powder they made known to the Mesopotamians as Shamana, the High Ward Firestone, the Elixir of Life, Philosopher's Stone, or White Bread to the Egyptians. After his time as Hermes, it's claimed that Saint Germain was King Solomon, the son of King David of Israel. King Solomon was the author of the Goetia, or Goetia, and the Keys of Solomon. He was rich, apostate, followed many gods, and was one of the greatest alchemists. He knew how to trap spirits into seals and use them for his own purposes. He is revered by the Freemasons, and he was, indeed, one of the most influential humans in the history of magic and secret knowledge. It's no wonder, then, that the goal of Freemasonry is to rebuild Solomon's temple, which they know is actually within, rather than being a temple itself. You are the temple. After his time as Solomon, it's claimed that Saint Germain was Plato, Merlin the Magician, and Christopher Columbus who discovered America. Saint Germain incarnated again through Sir Francis Bacon. Bacon wrote under various pen names, one of which being Shakespeare. Bacon was King James's Lord Chancellor, a master of alchemy and the occult, and is considered to be the father of deductive reasoning. Bacon's book, The New Atlantis, predicted a place where freedom and peace would reign under Masonic order without despotic rulers. It would be the place where the heritage of the House of Solomon could prosper under a golden age of science and logic. Bacon is also credited for providing ideas for the Great Seal of the United States. In 1626, Francis Bacon faked his own death and went to the Ricosi Mansion in Transylvania, where he continued his work in alchemy. Theosophists claim that on May 1st of 1684, he mastered the alchemical secrets and transmuted his mortal body into an immortal body. Francis Bacon chose to join the Great White Brotherhood of Light, a group of ascended masters. Now ascended, Bacon chose to work with humanity to help them all Ascend. New Age theology says that as an ascended master, he was allowed to return to a human body in order to teach others how to overcome the laws of the physical universe and usher in the golden age of humanity. It is said that when he reincarnated after his ascension, he was adopted into the royal house of Francis Ricosi II of Transylvania. When he grew up, he chose the Latin name Sanctus Germanus, or Saint Germain, meaning holy brother. We all know that Godrail likes his Latin names. So now we have a partial genealogy of the ascended master known as Saint Germain. He was Hermes or Thoth, King Solomon, Christopher Columbus, Francis Bacon, and finally, the Count of Saint Germain. The Count of Saint Germain was known as the Wonder Man of Europe and Asia. He was a diplomat, an alchemist. He spoke every language. He could remove flaws from jewels, and it's said that he was known as the Wonder Man of Europe and Asia. He was a diplomat, an alchemist. He spoke every language. He could remove flaws from jewels, and it's said that he had an elixir of life that preserved his health and youthfulness. No one knew exactly where he came from, or how old he was. It is said that he was seen for over 200 years. If you'd like a more complete history of Saint Germain, I suggest watching the video Changes on the Horizon. I'll leave a link to that in the description. Saint Germain worked closely with the Rosicrucians, the Lucis and the Freemasons. He also started the secret society known as the Knights and Brothers of Asia, who studied Rosicrucian and Hermetic science. In 1727, Saint Germain developed secret money-making techniques that he shared with European royalty and bankers. Instead of sharing the wealth with humanity, the bankers squandered it for themselves. So in 1729, Saint Germain created the World Trust. He, he specified that the World Trust would be released by the year 2000. And that was not an easy task, and is also the subject of my next video. In the 1770s, his followers say the Saint Germain worked behind the scenes with George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin, preparing the U.S. Constitution and Declaration of Independence. Saint Germain reformed the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians, secret societies. Are you noticing a pattern here? Nobility, alchemy, secret societies. Saint Germain was rumored to have died in 1784, but there were no witnesses and no record of such, and no one knows where he was buried. Ten years later, he was cited in Paris during the French Revolution. Voltaire once said, The Count of Saint Germain is a man who was never born, 
who will never die, and who knows everything. An effort was made in the 1800s to eliminate St. Germain's name from modern Freemasonry and Masonic literature when the Freemasons were taken over by a darker faction that was more interested in creating despotic rulers than in helping people ascend. The new darker faction of Freemasons followed the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, which are the complete opposite of the teachings of St. Germain. Despite their attempts to erase St. Germain's name from all of their lodges, the letter G still features prominently in Freemasonry's most recognizable symbol, the square and compass. Masons give several answers when asked what the G stands for. God, the great architect of the universe, the generative principle. Wouldn't it be interesting if the G stood for Germain or, ultimately, Godrael? Because the name Godrael literally means builder of God or mason of God, to me, the G could very well stand for the hidden name of God, their God, Godrael. Speak Speaking of Freemasonry, the Jewish year 5776 started on Yom Teruah, which was September 13th of 2015. Now, this is a very important year for Freemasonry, which has its own calendars. And to Masons, 5776 is known as Anno Lucis, or the Year of Light. This was indeed the year that Saint Germain regained control over the Freemasons and began to wage a war on the Cabal, that darker faction that took over for so many years. Now, in the Bible, the Cabal can be found in Revelation 13 as the first beast. In America, during the Obama administration, the Antichrist spirit of Belial could be found everywhere as we lived in a constant state of heightened fear. There was a fear of a military coup, of CERN, of Jade Helm, of mass shootings and guillotine-filled FEMA camps, apocalyptic doomsday scenarios. We started to notice a different kind of shift in 2015 when the Supreme Court ruled on same-sex marriage. When Love won. Now the world literally shifted in that same season when the possibly prophetic Nepal earthquake in April killed over 7,000 people. Where do the gods sleep? God sleep in the temple. On April 25th, in less than two minutes, centuries of history and culture are reduced to rubble. Now there's no temple, mainly. Uh, there's no god just like the earthquake in Revelation 11 says. 2015 was also the beginning of what the Cabal called weather warfare. This time in history was the beginning of the transition between the first beast of Revelation, the Cabal, to the second beast of Revelation, the Alliance. We've been experiencing Revelation 13.10, or the transition between the two beasts, ever since, and now we are ready to see the second beast, the Alliance, the false prophet, take over completely. In 1790, Saint Germain prophesied to his Austrian friend that exactly in 85 years will people set eyes on me again. 85 years from from that date brings us to 1875. It just so happens that in 1875, Helena Blavatsky founded the Theosophical School in New York City. Helena Blavatsky said that Saint Germain was one of her ascended masters of wisdom. Theosophy would introduce the idea that man's true liberation can come from the soul within, his higher self, and that each individual was indeed a part of God itself. Blavatsky's works revealed the existence of the Great White Brotherhood of Light and its hidden hand in moving the course of events throughout history. In the late, late 1800s, Blavatsky gave a clue as to who she followed when she published a magazine called Lucifer. The idea of Christ consciousness is very popular today thanks to celebrity Kabbalists like Deepak Chopra and has its roots in theosophy. Achieving Christ consciousness is essentially the same thing as enlightenment. It claims that you were created by God, and for that same reason, you are God. Now, while any philosophical idea can sound good, don't get caught up in the wordplay. Anyone could argue the exact opposite. For example, if God created you, then you are artificial. The way I, a computer programmer, would create a character. That character I create does not exist outside of its own game. I am still God, and they are not, even though I, God, created them. Not to mention that Christ consciousness sounds suspiciously familiar. As it says in Genesis 3, 5, Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. It's important to make this connection. We know that Godrael was in the garden when he uttered this first lie, promising Eve that she would be like a god through enlightenment. Now we see that this same lie has stayed the same for centuries and has been peddled throughout time by the same character, Godrael, who was Thoth, Hermes, King Solomon, Francis Bacon, Christopher Columbus, and Saint Germain. Regardless of the name, the entity known as Godrael, the serpent, that old dragon, Lucifer, has constantly been guiding us into believing this same lie. In the early 1900s, the basis of the I Am movement was given to the founder, Guy Ballard, by channeling Ascended Master Saint Germain. He taught Guy about the Great Creative Word, or I Am. 
The I Am Presence is said to be in each person and represents a point of contact with divine reality. The I Am movement was also instructed to preserve the idea of America, a revolutionary experiment in freedom, also known as the Great Masonic Experiment. In the 1950s, Saint Germain again used another messenger, Geraldine Innocente, to form the Bridge to Freedom movement. Through this movement, Saint Germain revealed more about the structure of the Great Brotherhood of Light, its continued governance of world affairs, and presented its future plans to bring in the new era. In 1958, Saint Germain used another messenger, Mark Prophet, and formed the Summit Lighthouse Movement, together with his wife, Elizabeth Claire Prophet. <laughs> They formed the Church Universal and Triumphant, a church dedicated to Saint Germain, Theosophy, and the I Am Presence. Elizabeth Clare Prophet describes the Ascended Master Saint Germain as the Violet Flame, the Shohan of the Seventh Ray, and the sponsor of the United States. This is why America is so important at this time in history. Remember, Saint Germain was overshadowing Christopher Columbus, who was credited with discovering America. In reality, he didn't discover anything. He destroyed a nation and its people. From Hermes onward, it is said that Saint Germain tried to liberate humanity from the tyrannical rulers and raise human thinking and logic. His followers say that the whole earth is subject to his will, as he now takes takes his place as the teacher for the new Aquarian age. This quote, quote from Elizabeth Clare Prophet explains exactly what's happening today. With the emergence of Q and Trump eliminating the deep state, she says, At the helm of this momentous purging of Earth's dark forces is the great and holy master Sanctus Germanus, again appearing at this particular flashpoint as he did in the past history to guide and protect us at the threshold of the new age. Trump's sole mission is indeed the same as the one attributed to Saint Germain, to get rid of the dark of all, or drain the swamp. So in conclusion, this New Age movement, based on ancient secret knowledge, is just a religion for people who are not religious. Not only has most of the world embraced the New Age, the world has also fallen for the deception of the new worldwide religion, love. This new mindset instructs humanity to love everyone, because we are all one, and to send love and light. This translates to avoidance of personal responsibility and avoidance of accountability of actions. When everything is permissible, what is the point in modifying your behavior? Unconditional love corrects, instructs, and condemns that which is not true or safe. Truth is love, and sometimes love hurts. I know some, know some people are not going to like what I have to say because it makes people uncomfortable, but I'm trying to present you with information you can arm yourself with to speak the truth to people around you in your own life. The hidden knowledge within the occult is very ego-driven and that it somehow has more value because it is hidden and takes a bit of work to find when it's really just a watered-down or twisted version of truth. But because it is hidden, there is a certain value placed on its information. After all, value is created in scarcity. But that's the thing. As history will show, the information found in the ancient world that's been rebranded into the New Age is not scarce. It's saturated our entire world for centuries. What is extremely scarce is the truth. Some say that God did not want mankind to be wise like him. Yet, a major source of their power on Earth is by doing just that, withholding knowledge from mankind whether it be through education, initiation, or through positions of power. The uninitiated are somehow less than and unworthy of information. It isn't until the initiate can control his lower self or base instincts that he is worthy of learning philosophical principles. Again, this is contrary to everything God and Jesus did. His information was open to all people in all places. How is it then that God is cruel for withholding information, but when Lucifer does it, it is not cruel? It is not logical or wise to believe that Lucifer is the god of wisdom, enlightenment, and knowledge. John 8.44 says he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth found in him. Of course, God told Eve that if she ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil that she would surely die. Lucifer told her that if she ate from the tree, she would be like a god. Eve believed him and ultimately she died. So which one of them told the truth? And then there are some who believe that they are God. So, you are God. Why are you taking orders from other people? Or from other gods, like the Ascended Masters? Why are you making the rules? Even worse, why are you subject to a plan or an agenda instead of making the plan yourself? You're a God and yet you're still learning? You mean you're not all-knowing? Jesus teaches about this exact ideology in Matthew 24 verses 4 through 5, when he says, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. In verse 23, he says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, 
they deceive the very elect. Not only has Christ consciousness deceived the New Agers, but even the elect, or those who identify as Christians, have been deceived by Trump and Q, who have somehow managed to cancel the tribulation. Now, if you believe yourself to be godlike, such as the case with Christ consciousness, how is it then the events that are unfolding have been prophesied for centuries, correlating with the last hour of the last days? when the false prophet beast system has full control. You're in control, yet we're marching full speed into a monetary reset, begun by none other than Saint Germain and his world trust? Again, our collective consciousness has not raised to a level of consciousness needed to achieve heaven on earth. Rather, we have chosen at a higher level to reject the truth, and that is why we are about to witness the most debated, misunderstood, and feared event in human history. I'm talking about the Mark of the Beast. In my next video, I'm going to tie up how all of this relates to the last prophecy to be fulfilled before Jesus' return. I should say Jesus' physical return. And what Saint Germain, the New Age, King Solomon, Q, Trump, and Gold have to do with it. And most importantly, what you need to know and what you need to do about it. Thank you guys for watching this video. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to comment below. I'll see you in the next video. You believe in God? Sure. I believe in myself. And why wouldn't I? <laughs> and Jesus is coming back everywhere. And nothing can stop it. It's a consciousness that lives in your mind. Da, 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 da. Who is Saint Germain, and why is he important to the events happening today? Saint Germain is considered to be an ascended master by many occult groups. Before his ascension, he incarnated many times or lived many lives throughout history. These incarnations have been documented by his followers in Theosophy, the New Age, Freemasonry, the Order of the Golden Dawn, the Rosicrucians, and the Knights of Columbus for centuries. He is considered to be the true sovereign Grand Master of both Freemasonry and the Knights of Columbus. Some of Saint Germain's alleged incarnations include the High Priest of Atlantis, Thoth, Hermes Trismegistus, King Solomon, Plato, Merlin the Magician, Christopher Columbus, and Francis Bacon, to name a few. The It's another wonderful day in California. I hope everyone is safe, healthy, and ready for another episode. In the English language, there are two supreme masterpieces of literature that seem to stick out above all others that were both published in the city of London within 12 years of each other. The first is the King James Version of the Bible, which was published in 1611, and secondly, the collected works of William Shakespeare, which was published in 1623. The King James Bible was put together by six groups, comprised of some 54 translators, of which we know very little about. Not one of the translators has left any literary work which would justify the belief that they were capable of writing the more beautiful portions of the Bible. The revised translation of the Bible was undertaken as a national work, carried out under the personal supervision of the king, but every record of the proceedings has disappeared. The British Museum does not contain any manuscript connected with the proceedings of the translators. As for the Shakespeare works, the reputed author, William Shakespeare, not only had illiterate parents, illiterate children, and no formal education, but judging by the illegible and incomplete six signatures he left behind, he was more than likely illiterate himself. Not a single letter or poem has ever been found in Shakespeare's own handwriting. A man credited with writing 36 plays and over 150 sonnets. He is considered a literary genius, allegedly producing so much, yet 
couldn't find the time to teach his own two daughters to read or write. Most of his writings concerned the lives of the aristocracy, of which he himself was not a part of. So how was he so familiar with their ways? That said, many people who are familiar with the material agree that the likely author of the Shakespeare works is Francis Bacon. The speculation regarding this goes all the way back to 1598, the year Shakespeare's name first appeared on one of his plays, when more than one of his contemporaries published about recognizing Francis Bacon as being the actual author. Francis Bacon was an English philosopher and statesman who served as Attorney General and Lord Chancellor of England. His works are credited with developing the scientific method based on inductive reasoning and observing nature. Bacon died at the age of 65 of pneumonia and had no heirs. As for the King James Bible, a book published in 1905 by William Spedley puts forth the theory that Bacon rewrote the translator's manuscripts to produce the literary masterpiece that is the King James authorized version of the Bible. Smedley exhibits remarkable insight into Bacon's motives and provides evidence to support his contention that Bacon edited the final draft of the translations, concluding that, quote, There was only one writer of the period who was capable of turning the phrases with that matchless style which is the great charm of the Shakespeare plays. Whoever that stylist was, it was to him that James handed over the manuscripts, which he received from the translators. That man made havoc of much of the translation, but he produced a result which, on its literary merits, is without equal. Please keep in mind that Francis Bacon was a 33rd degree Freemason, and it is said that his agenda revolved around encoding the text with gematria, which is an alphanumeric code of assigning a numerical value to a name, word, or phrase based on its letters. One should also note that the word Lucifer was added in this edition, where in Isaiah it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? While this line stirs up a lot of controversy, we can get a better understanding of its context from another high-level mason, Eliphas Levy, author of The Mysteries of Magic, who says, quote, What is more absurd and more impious than to attribute the name of Lucifer to the devil, that is, to personified evil? The intellectual Lucifer is the spirit of intelligence and love. It is the paraclete. It is the Holy Spirit, while the physical Lucifer is the great agent of universal magnetism. In her book, The Secret Doctrine, Helena Petrova Blavatsky says, quote, Lucifer represents life, thought, progress, civilization, liberty, independence. Lucifer is the logos, the serpent, the savior. Another 33rd degree Mason, Albert Pike, is quoted as saying, Lucifer is divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost, and Satan, at one and the same time. In this context, the light bearer is not a person with a pointy tail in a fiery pit, but a force of nature which has potential for what, from our perspective, could be defined as good or evil, rather than a devil with a pitchfork made popular in contemporary movies and cartoons. I covered the Holy Ghost in a video last week. I'll include a link in the description if you'd like to see it. In his book, Morals and Dogma, Albert Pike once again says, quote, Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light and with its splendors, intolerable, blinds the feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not. Another proponent of this line of thought in regards to Bacon is author and honorary 33-degree mason, Manly P. Hall, who in 1929, at a lecture titled Rosicrucian and Masonic Origins, said, quote, The first edition of the King James Bible, which was edited by Francis Bacon and prepared under Masonic supervision, bears more Mason's marks than the Cathedral of Strasbourg. And that's coming from Manly Hall, who literally wrote the book on Masonic symbolism. Dr. H. Spencer Lewis, 
Emperor of the Rosicrucian Order during the 1920s and 30s, said in the April 1930 edition of Rosicrucian Digest, quote, The Bible, which all of us read and admire from a literary point of view because of its peculiar and beautiful English, was written in that form by Bacon, who invented and perfected that style of English expression. The first editions of the Bible were printed under the same guidance and in the same manner as were the Shakespeare plays, and the ornaments for the various pages were drawn in pen and ink and on wood by artists engaged by Bacon who worked under his supervision. Every one of the ornaments concealed some Rosicrucian emblem, and occasionally a Masonic emblem, or some initials that would reveal Bacon's name, or the name of the Rosicrucians. Some ornaments were put not only in the Christian Bible that Bacon had rewritten, but in the Shakespeare plays, and in some of Bacon's own books, and a few other books that were typically Rosicrucian in spirit. Edwin D. Lawrence, author of Bacon is Shakespeare and the Shakespeare Myth, said in a lecture in 1912 that, quote, The 1611 King James Bible is ornamented with Bacon symbols, and in my own special copy of the record edition, also dated 1611, these symbols are Rosicrucianly marked to call the attention of the initiated to them and to tell them that the 1611 Bible is without possibility of doubt one of Bacon's books. When Bacon was born, English as a literary language did not exist, but once he died, he had succeeded in making the English language the noblest vehicle of thought ever possessed by mankind. This he accomplished merely by his Bible and his Shakespeare. Now, I know this is a controversial topic for many people, and I'll leave it to the viewer to make up their own mind as to what books or sources they derive their spiritual guidance from. That said, I just wanted to point out that regardless of who translated the King James Bible, or if it was encoded with Gematria, or edited by Francis Bacon, or someone else, it was largely based on the most common manuscripts available at the time particularly the Byzantine family of Greek translations. So while many people consider the Bible, particularly the King James Version, as the direct inspired word of God, I just want to point out that it was based on a small percentage of material from a much larger selection of material, much of which has come to light after the book was compiled and published. One example being the Nag Hammadi Library, a collection of 13 ancient books containing over 50 texts discovered in Upper Egypt in 1945 and thought to have been entirely destroyed during the early Christian era. Its translation was not only completed in the 1970s and not only contains much of the same material but expanded versions of it and other scriptures such as the Gospel of Thomas which I will cover in a future video. Another example not included in King James yet was very popular in the ancient world, was the Book of Enoch, ascribed by tradition to Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah. While I already covered this previously more than once, I will cover it again, focusing on parts that expand on the sections of Genesis, speaking to the Nephilim who lusted after the beautiful daughters of men and took them as wives and impregnated them, only briefly alluded to in King James, in an obviously incomplete fashion. In closing, I would like to quote one more Masonic author, Carl Claudy, who said, Cut through the outer shell and find a meaning. Cut through that meaning and find another. Under it, if you dig deep enough, you may find a third. A fourth. Who shall say how many teachings? My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. I'd like to thank those who support me through patreon.com. There should be a link below for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I also would like to extend my gratitude to anyone who shares these videos. As I rely on word of mouth, please remember to hit the like button and also to subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section. So please leave me a comment below. Have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon.